Welcome to another week of worship. I'm Jeff Seaver, pastor at Triumph Lutheran Brethren Church, and whether you relate to our campus in West Fargo, Triumph West, or Triumph East in Moorhead, or maybe you're just stopping by today on our YouTube channel, but for every reason, we're glad that you're here today and just pray that this is going to be a really encouraging moment in these interesting times in which we're living. Last week, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. A week's gone by. This week, we're going to see the wonderful work that Jesus does as, as he brings faith alive and does his life-transforming work in the lives of ordinary people like us. So we're glad that you're here. I hope you're encouraged. Hey, thank you, Pastor Jeff, and welcome, Triumph, to our next online worship service. We're glad to have you here with us. I invite you to join us as we begin this service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our call to worship comes from the 103rd chapter of the Psalms. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all, all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and, who, and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with God, with good things so that you, your youth is renewed like the eagles. Thanks, Jacob. I'll invite you all to uh, worship with us as we continue. We're going to sing Lighthouse together, and I ask some of the children's ministry staff to join us and have some actions as we sing so we can worship the Lord with our voices and with our bodies. And it is a privilege to be worshiping in your home with you from our home here. Let's lift our voices and our hearts to the Lord. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea.
Well, thanks, Dan and Jaken, for sharing with us. Welcome to Triumph's online uh, church service. This is a part in our service where we share about the life that's happening in our church. Uh, it's kind of apropos standing in the hub at our West Campus and knowing that uh, how often on Sundays this place is just bustling with noise and joy, um, and for us to be standing here and not seeing that life happen. But life in the church is still happening, but it's happening in your homes, right? Because we know that church isn't canceled, it's just moved. You've been sharing photos with us about where that's been happening, and so take a look at this slideshow. being able to see those pictures, and I hope it's been an encouragement for you. I know it's been an encouragement for me. I'd love for you to be sending those in this upcoming week about how that life in the church is still happening in your homes, but I would also like for you to share with us another picture, and that is a picture of the state of your hair. Yes, that's right. What does your hair look like in the midst of this COVID-19? What does your facial hair look like? It has taken me a long time to wet this puppy down up here. So if you are so bold, would you stand in the gap with me and be willing to be a part of a photo montage of our bad hair during this coronavirus? I would love for you to be able to share us, share that and for us to see that next week. But on a more serious note, um, we have been so um, thankful and we have been incredibly encouraged um, by the prayers that you have been sending us and how you have, have partnered with us and shown that through your generosity. Um, it means the world to us. Uh, I want you to know that we are hard at work of not only preparing well for today, um, but thinking about the future and thinking about how God is presenting the church and triumph with opportunities for more people to know the gospel and for his church to be built up. And so we are just thankful that you have given us that opportunity and that you have partners with us in that way. Uh, but we're always reminded that generosity is something that is a healthy pattern. In 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, it says this, Now about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the very first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Let's pray. Father, we are just so thankful uh, that we get to be a part of this healthy pattern, that we get to be a part of your kingdom moving forward. Father, we are thankful that you are on your throne and that there is no disease, no pestilence that you cannot overcome. Lord, we know that you have overcome uh, the biggest disease of all, that is the victory over sin. Father, we are so thankful for that reminder this last week as we got to talk about Resurrection Sunday, Lord, that you have been risen and you have been risen indeed. We thank you for that. We celebrate that. And we thank you that your church is still moving forward. Your church is still alive. And we are thankful that we get to be a part of that. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Christian. What a gift it is to see how the Lord is at work in us and through us. Well, as we continue, let's lift our voices together and sing of the great things that our Lord has done on our behalf.
Bible with you and ready, I would love it if you would turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. If you don't have your Bible with you, don't worry about it. The scripture will be on the screen for you. We are going to read verses, chap- verses 18 through 22 in Jesus' name. But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. We don't know what this season has looked like for you or even what today looks like for you, but God does. God sees you, and he knows you, and he loves you, and he meets you right where you are. We have a unique opportunity today to to do something that we maybe have never felt comfortable doing in a corporate worship setting. I know um, it's a little outside of my comfort zone, which is why I'm asking you to do it with me. So let's step outside of our collective comfort zones and do this together. Are you ready? Open your hands and lift them up. Close your eyes. Let's reflect a little bit on what these last few weeks have held. Maybe what we're holding on to. And in that, let's ask God what it is that we need to release. God, what are we clinging to? Is it our fear? Our expectations? 
our need for control. Now leave your hands open in expectation to receive God's promise of redemption. It may not be today or tomorrow, but friends, God promises us that he will work all things together for our good and for his glory. Will you pray with me? God, you are faithful and trustworthy. Your word is true, and it promises that it will not return empty. When we need the reminder, God, would you help us remember that no matter how many promises you have made to us, they are yes in Christ. It's because of him that we can say amen to your glory. Even when we can't feel it, even when we can't see it, we know that you're working. We can believe it and receive it. Yes and amen. Let's bring our prayer as an offering as we worship together. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name. to this what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus it didn't want heaven without us so Jesus you
Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you that you are with us. Would you, by your, the working of your spirit, bless our gatherings wherever we are. Would you open our ears to hear your word today, Lord, in your name. The lyric of the song says, I've never been out of your care. This changing world alarms me, but my loving father charms me with joy, with peace, and with life. He knows every thought I think, he knows every word that I might say, but I've never been out of his care. Let's look together today at Luke chapter 24, a wonderful section of scripture. I love this portion. It's the story of two disciples on that day that Jesus was raised from the dead, but they hadn't seen him yet. And they're on their way back to a town called Emmaus. Luke 24, starting at verse 13. Now that same day, Two of them were going to a town called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, with their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? What things, Jesus asked. What things about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, 
and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and and found that it was just as the women had said, but they didn't see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer all these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scripture concerning himself. As they approached the village, the one they were going to, Jesus himself continued as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it's nearly evening. The day's almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked to us on the road and opened the scripture to us? And then they got up, returned at once to Jerusalem. And there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It's true, the Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened to them on their way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Let's pray. Lord, this week after Easter, we continue to marvel at the wonder of who you are. And Lord, today we pray as we take a look at this portion of your word, would you come and would you speak to our hearts, Lord? Remind us again of who you are, of what we need to remember. So Lord, we ask you to come by the power of your Holy Spirit, and speak to us today as only you can, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus walks with us. He comes to us often before we ever think of coming to him. We find two disciples walking that day. They had seen way too much in the last few days. These last few days, I've been walking a lot. In fact, I've got this app on my phone. It tracks how far you walk. And and I've been really intentional about my walking uh, for several reasons. But I, I sat down and added up all the numbers. I've been averaging about 28 and a half miles a week. No, I'm serious, really. That's like four miles a day, a little more than that. Now, there's reasons why I've been doing this. Uh, Some of us from college days, remember, uh, we called it the College 15. Somebody posted just the other day, now I've learned about COVID-19. And they weren't talking about the virus. They were talking about, yeah, the tonnage. I don't know how it's going for you, but being at home most of the time, I've probably been eating more than I need to. But I've also needed to get out. Walking has really helped me. Physically, just uh, keeps me moving. Uh, Emotionally, really helping me to fend off the old cabin fever. Spiritually, whoa, favorite part of my day, just to get out, to realize that life is returning to the tundra. I mean, it's been so cold this past week. I've been walking in snow and it's mid-April, unbelievable. But in the midst of it, I'm seeing again the wonder of God's creation. I'm realizing that even though our world seems so upside down right now, so much of what God has made continues on as normal. The birds are returning. I hear them singing. I'm watching the ducks and the geese. Oh, it's good. Just to walk and to feel the fresh air on my face, to breathe that 
wonderful breath, just to feel the joy of being able to walk. It's been really good for me. The two disciples that we read about today, they were walking. They had gone through some incredible stress, seeing the one that they had put all their hopes in die. They didn't know what to do. And as they're talking about what they had seen these past days, the story even they had heard of the women who'd been at the tomb, in the midst of that discussion, it says that Jesus joins them in their walk, but they're kept from recognizing him. And he says, well, what are you guys talking about? They stop in their tracks. They say, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who hasn't heard about what's been going on? What things? And they began to tell of what they had watched in the past days. They also talk about the great disappointment that they had. Jesus knows all these things. Interesting statement here. It says they didn't recognize Jesus, or actually they were kept from recognizing him. I wonder why that was. You know, there are times in my life when I'm going through uh, crazy stress. I get so preoccupied that I sometimes miss the obvious. I, I look back sometimes and go, how did I not see that? Or what was I thinking? How, how could I forget something so basic? I don't know exactly why they were kept from recognizing Jesus, but I have a suspicion I think it was important for them at that moment to be led to remember some things that they had known long before, but in the stress of the moment had forgotten. So how's it going with you these days? Are you recognizing Jesus in the midst of the struggle, the stress? Or are you like me on so many days my mind goes to all the wonderings, the what-ifs, when's this going to end, how's this going to impact my life, the lives of people around me. For these two, as they walked, they needed to realize again that there is a word in the Scripture used over 250 times, Old and New Testament, the word is remember. They would need to remember what God has said. And they would need to remember that Jesus was closer to them than they even realized. They needed to remember that he cared for them. Secondly, today, Jesus speaks to them from his word and through his word. Growing up, we had something uh, called party lines, Telephones weren't what they were today. Uh, typically, a home had one phone. In some of the areas, party lines were really strange. If a neighbor got a call, all the rings went through all the homes. Every home just had assigned a different ring. So you always knew when somebody was calling. Where we lived, that wasn't the case. You only heard this phone ring when it was a call coming to you. But what would often happen is unknowingly you'd pick up the phone and hear somebody talking and politely you just hang up and wait your turn. But that wasn't always the case. Uh, some found this to be a wonderful form of entertainment. Some were really good at it. I remember one day my mom was on the phone talking with someone and she heard that quiet click of a receiver picking up somewhere in the party line. My mom had a good suspicion who, was, who it was, and so breaking all protocol, she said, Gladys, hang up, click. She heard it. Oh, man. <clears throat> she kind of knew, and the lady, Gladys, knew also that she'd been had. The conversation that went on on this day between Jesus and those disciples, oh, I would have loved to listen in to this one. You see, the, the disciples unpacked what they understood about Jesus, that he was a great prophet, 
the things he had seen and how he had been crucified. But they also said this, we had hoped, we had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel. (laughs) They were distressed. In fact, it says when Jesus asked what they were talking about, they stood still and were downcast. Jesus knew exactly what they were struggling with. You see, they saw just part of the story that day. They knew their part of the story, like it is so many times for us. We don't know, we don't recognize Jesus in the midst of it. We go through that with each other. We know our part of the story and sometimes get so frustrated with others and we don't know their story. But in the midst of it, God is at work. Jesus was at work on this day. And he begins to open the scripture to them. He says, oh, you who are foolish and slow to believe, didn't the Messiah have to suffer these things? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scripture concerning himself. Oh, what an incredible moment that the one who was the word that had become flesh would take them back and open the very word of God to them that they might begin to remember exactly who Jesus is and what the prophets and Moses had said concerning him. One commentator by the name of Barclay says, Jesus has the ability to make sense of all things. And on that day, Jesus was beginning to help them make sense of everything they had seen, although they were still just understanding part of it. Do you realize that There are over 300 references to the coming Messiah in the Old Testament. One one author says 353 different references, promises concerning the coming Messiah. And Jesus would walk them through these incredible words. After the fact, after their eyes were opened, they would remember what Jesus had said to them and, and they would say this, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? You know, the Apostle Paul would later write that that is exactly the work, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He says it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He said, but the Spirit who is from God has come so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit. Jesus opened the scripture to them, and then he opened their understanding. And they began to understand again that his love for them, his care for them was real. His words said so, they needed to remember just like I need to remember these days. A really good prayer for these days would be, Jesus, would you open your word to me? And would you open my understanding that I might see you again and trust you? And finally, Jesus opens their eyes. If you're following along, verse 30 of this chapter says, when he was at the table with them, he took bread gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. (laughs) What a moment. They've been walking with this guy for who knows how long. And suddenly, it's like scales fall off their eyes, and they go, Lord, it's you. And immediately, he disappears. But they had their eyes opened to see Jesus, and they were changed as a result of it. Oh, they were no longer downcast. These were guys suddenly re-energized, filled with hope, and they weren't sitting at home anymore. I mean, they'd just been walking who knows how long, maybe the whole seven miles to get back. 
But they got up and immediately they tore back to Jerusalem. And it says that they found the 11 and others who were with them. And when they walked in, they said, the Lord's risen, he's appeared to Peter. And they went, yeah, and he's appeared to us too. It's incredible. Their lives were changed from being just without hope and so downcast and depressed to being lifted up. Why? Because they'd seen Jesus and because they remembered again the truth of his word. God opened the scripture. He opened their understanding and he opened their eyes to see Jesus and they couldn't keep it to themselves. There are a lot of people struggling around us today. They maybe have not come to that place of understanding what the scripture says about the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, our risen Savior. But if you have, then you have a wonderful opportunity to bring the hope of Christ to the people around you. Sometimes our job as Christians is just to remind Christians around us of what's true, to remind them again of what God has said and that his promises are true and trustworthy, to remind each other again that he cares for us. I've been thinking of those words of Jesus when he taught his disciples to pray. He, he prayed, Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Our complete understanding of that, we don't grasp yet. Even as we pray that, it puts it, us in a place of having to trust him, to trust that he's king that he has all power and authority. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter chapter 5. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Dear one, hold on to that truth today. You might be walking and overwhelmed by the consequences of what you're seeing right now. Jesus is near, maybe nearer than you recognize. Oh, that he would open his word to us again, remind us of what's true, and ultimately open our eyes that we might see Jesus and be lifted up brought to a place where we can cast all our cares, our anxieties on him because he cares for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you knew the struggle of those disciples as they walked on that day and you cared. You cared enough to come to them. And Jesus, you do that now you come to us. Lord, we need you to do that. We are so easily discouraged and so easily distracted and so easily made afraid. Lord Jesus, come. Remind us again of your truth. Open our eyes, open our understanding that we might see you and believe. And Jesus, I pray that you would just lift us up, trusting you, resting in you. And when those cares and worries come, that we would just cast those things right to you, Lord, as we bow before you, acknowledging that you are our King, our Lord, but you're also our Father who loves his children. Jesus, come. Keep us in your care, we pray. May we rest in your loving arms today. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Vern. Let's respond together in song with Be Thou My Vision.
Thanks so much for joining us today in worship. It's a privilege to be able to come into your life and share his truth with you. Would you receive today his benediction? This is the heart of God for you. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. For we ask this in the name of Jesus, our risen Savior. God bless you.